Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger, Genetic Insights, and this podcast, Owen Robinson. And today we are discussing male hormonal optimization. So tell me, Owen, why did you want to discuss this topic today? Yeah, great question. Uh, well, two reasons. I know we've talked a lot about different male hormones before, um, and you did uh, an episode not that long ago of Dr. Miriam about female hormone optimization. And when I was looking for a reference to send someone, I realized we hadn't actually created a video which was a complete guide. And also in the last few months, I've had several uh, doctors who do specialize in bioidentical hormones all reach out to me for advice on this subject because um, I think, you know, obviously there's loads of TRT doctors out there and clinics and stuff, but when it came to some of the intricacies and the nuances of some of the stuff we talk about in this channel, there's actually very little, um, you know, like there's not many people who really get it who are experts in it. Um, and so for that reason, I thought, well, you know, if not just clients and customers, but even doctors are reaching out to me <laughs> asking for guidance, why not? create like a, you know, a guide that is the best of my understanding from everything that I've learned. Obviously, this does not supersede any medical advice. This is merely a guide for people who obviously there are some open minded doctors out there. So for any open minded doctors who are watching, or for any non doctors who want to perhaps send this to your doctor or a portion of it to your doctor to say, you know, this is what I was talking about. This is what I'd like help with. This is the perspective that I would like you to consider, that's really what we're uh, creating this episode for. Yes, I know when we did that episode with Dr. Miriam on female hormones, it was very interesting to do a deep dive into them because we know we have them, but a lot of times we don't know the exact, you know, um, intricacies behind them. So I'm glad we're bringing this to the forefront today. And also too, with women, there is the fluctuation as we age. And so I wanted to ask you, as we start to kick it off with men, you know, do they have the same kinds of fluctuations that women have? No, not in terms of it being monthly and kind of revolving around the cycles of the moon. Uh, they absolutely definitely do have fluctuations, you know, some people like testosterone has, um, you know, spikes and crashes throughout the day. So th there are those kind of variations. Um, and obviously, you know, there are other hormones which are non-sexual, which have, or non-male specific, which absolutely are, what's the word, um, uh, like have a daily cycle. So, you know, cortisol, for instance, you know, the highest when you wake up and slowly should be going lower throughout the day, all of those kind of things. Um, but I would say, you know, it's cliche or archetypal, but they say the men are more like the sun and women are more like the moon. So with men, their hormonal cycles, if there is such a thing, and it's not as obvious with women, would be daily and also yearly, which would be more solar. Um, so for instance, vitamin D has an important impact on testosterone. That's something that, you know, other than supplementation before supplementation, that would obviously be boosted during the summer months in northern climates, um, and then would be, you know, lower in the winter months, for instance. So that would be, again, like a solar example. I would say male hormones are not as intricate as women's, but maybe that's my own bias. I, I find male hormones simpler, but um, th there's just, like, less people who are, because it's uh, less of a challenge. There's less people who are focused on helping men. And so even though it is easier to help men than women, I would say there's a lot less going on other than the kind of simple TRT stuff, which definitely does help a lot of people. I'm not against it. Um, but I think it's in many cases, it's not the whole story. Right. And then how about as men age, are their hormones going to go into decline? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know we've got a list. I actually don't have the list in front of me. I know you've got a list, but <laughs> when you go for the list, we'll, we'll take it case by case. Um, but yeah, some of the, uh, you, you know, ones that are not male specific, like DHEA, for instance, um, you know, it's, it's one of the terms for it is the youth hormone because there is such an obvious correlation that uh, the younger and more vital you are, the higher it is. And as you age, it goes down a lot. Uh, it's true for a lot of hormones. I actually think it's even true for some hormones that are not thought of as declining of age, like thyroid. This is something that's not being correctly tracked, but I think we'll talk about thyroid as well a little bit. I know I've talked about it loads in previous episodes, so we won't go too in depth. Um, we'll just talk about it in relation to men. And um, 
you know, definitely, obviously, the primary one that's talked about is testosterone, and this absolutely does decline of age. Uh, you know, they used to say beyond the age of 30, but really, you know, there's an argument to be made that um, it declines significantly earlier these days with the toxic assault plus stress plus other kind of, um, uh, you know, spe specifically estrogen type chemicals that men are, everyone is dealing with, including men, uh, mean that I would say the testosterone decline is more severe and starts earlier than ever before in recorded history. Yeah, we do and have done and, and talked about um, estrogen dominance, adrenaline dominance. And now how does that affect men? Um, well, not as badly as women in most cases so far, honestly. Uh, this is why a lot of those issues do affect women more. Women do tend to suffer more with fatigue. Women do tend to suffer more with thyroid, low thyroid, which is uh, you know correlated with adrenaline uh, dominance specifically. Women do suffer more with, although mm, I'd contest this, but certainly from a mainstream perspective, women do suffer more with the, uh, how do we say this to not get in trouble, um, undesirable excessive growth, which correlates with estrogen, which can be potentially um, life um, threatening. Those are absolutely increased by estrogen especially all the uh endocrine um what's the word disruptors uh, or no no like the endocrine manifestations of that particular disease so breast mm, uh, ovarian mm, you know all of these kind of things these uh uh definitely you know have an estrogenic component i would actually argue uh that it does affect women more than men though because prostate mm, is actually um you know, more common than breast. And, uh, and yet, uh, that's considered to not be primarily estrogenic, but I, I, I don't believe that that is correct. I believe estrogen has a huge part to play in that. And, that uh, the other thing that's often blamed for that DHT is actually incorrectly blamed for it. Okay. So what I'm hearing as well is that the disruption in these hormones, it can have lots of negative side effects, especially the ones that you were discussing that we really don't want to have. We want to have just a, you know, the most optimal life and healthy life that we possibly can. And, yes. um, uh, just, just, sorry, just to go yeah, back, go ahead. I do think that the estrogen affects women more. So the excess estrogen in, you know, um, that we're being exposed to does affect women worse than men, uh, overall, because, you know, women have higher estrogen, at least until midlife. Um, so, you know, if you have a low amount and you add something to it, that's not going to have as bad an effect as already having a high amount and adding something to it, right? So just logically um, in that sense. And then also, uh, you know, testosterone opposes estrogen to some degree, even though, of course, also testosterone turns into estrogen. But in terms of the effects, testosterone opposes estrogen. And so I do think women have it worse with excess estrogen being more problematic for them overall. Okay. And then you were talking specifically about bioidentical hormones. Now, what's the difference, or can you go into explaining the difference between natural versus uh, synthetic or more medical hormone supplementation? Uh, yeah, definitely. So what does bioidentical mean? It means that if you uh, look at it in a laboratory, you will not be able to tell the difference between this exogenous, uh, meaning outside the body, uh, often plant-derived or maybe chemically synthesized hormone and the stuff that your body actually makes. If there's any chemical differences between them, then it's not bioidentical. Um, and so, unfortunately, a lot of the direction that mainstream medicine has gone in is to not use bioidentical hormones, to use other synthetically synthesized hormones or sometimes hormones from other animals that are not exactly the same as what the human body produces uh, for various reasons, which I suppose we won't go into because this is going to be a practical episode. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, if it's not exactly the same as what your body creates, it, uh, naturally, then it can create problems for all kinds of reasons. Right. And so when somebody is potentially looking at this, they want to make sure that they're re requesting from their doctor, they want bioidentical, not anything else, correct? I would say so. Obviously, this is something to discuss with you and your doctor. But when seeking a doctor to help with these kind of things, I personally would always 
look for a doctor who specialized in bioidentical hormones. That would be, if I wanted help with my hormones, that would be my number one criteria. Now, this isn't always relevant in every case, like, you know, for thyroid, like all the hormones that anyone would give you a bioidentical, even, you know, levothyroxine or, you know, the very standard drug that a mainstream medical doctor would give you is bioidentical. Um, but when it comes to the sex hormones, often that's not the case. And so that's where it's more important that you you seek that person out. But I would say even with thyroid, with anything, if you look at a if you look for a doctor who specializes in bioidentical hormones, if it says that on their website, if it says that in their you know, social media description or whatever, that's a not a guarantee, but it's a good indicator that you found someone who has at least a reasonably good chance of being able to help you. That, that would be one of my primary uh, screening tools. Wonderful. One more question before we get into our list. So can't somebody just decide to do natural interventions versus things like uh, going in and supplementing with bioidentical hormones? Yes. They absolutely can, and often that is actually a good idea. So I think what I'm going to do in this episode is, like for each of the hormones you asked me about, I'm just going to say what I think is the best, like as a great generalization. Now, I think for every single thing there, um, they're probably, well, do I think is there an exception? There is like a natural path to lowering it. I'll try and remember, and you can prompt me if I forget, Chrissy, like to give a few natural things and then also to give like a, a medical possibility as well with each one and then i'll try and remember again if you prompt me to say like which you know is the most effective and it isn't always the medical thing in fact um so yeah i think that's how we'll do it for people who are so people who are philosophically against the medical you know i've talked about this in previous episodes to me the line between a medicine or a drug a supplement and a food is completely arbitrary. And I gave examples of that before, I'm, I won't do it all again, but I'll do one that's relevant to this. You know, like uh, I know the first one on your list here is uh, pregnenolone. Um, in your country, the USA, Chrissy, that's classed as a supplement. In my country, the UK, that's classed as a drug. So, I mean, again, it's purely arbitrary. Who's right, who's wrong? Well, it's something that exists naturally in your body. It's made out of cholesterol. Uh, you know, there's cholesterol in all kinds of foods. Uh, is cholesterol a drug? No, you know, why is it when we convert it into pregnenolone, it suddenly is a drug? Um, okay, but then the pregnenolone can be converted into testosterone. Is testosterone a drug? Well, you know, a lot of people would kind of say, yes, you know, it can have very strong effects. So <laughs> do you see what I mean? Like the lines are not clear to me. So that's my first answer. Um, now, obviously, I, I think a lot of the laws around this are actually quite reasonable. Generally, the hormones that are classed as drugs is because there is room for abuse and there is room for danger. Like with pregnant alone, as much as I don't recommend it, if you accidentally have way more than you should, it probably won't harm you. Uh, that's not true for like thyroid hormone and it's not true for insulin. And that's why those are controlled substances that they are hormones that are treated as medicines. And so I think it's fair enough. Um, but I'm just saying like the... If we're talking about bioidenticals, the line is pretty arbitrary. Is it better to improve these things just by lifestyle changes, uh, nutrients, diet, herbs maybe, rather than going straight into a prescription medicine? Uh, yeah, in many cases it is, but this is really context dependent as well. So people who don't have a lot of money uh, and don't have access to a doctor who can prescribe this kind of stuff, uh, the best option is probably lifestyle changes. To people who have some money, but don't have access to a doctor or don't want access to a doctor, then often supplements like herbs and nutrition is the best way of doing things. But for those who want like results as quickly as possible, because it's super important, you know, like maybe you're a single parent who's just struggling to, you know, keep the family going and paying the rent, you you know, in my opinion, you can't afford to be a purist to be like, ooh, I want to do it the natural way. You'd be like, whatever makes me feel better and able to function now so my kids aren't homeless is the correct approach. Do you see what I mean? So, like, it, it, it depends a lot on what your circumstances are. What, and so that's why I don't have a value judgment on it anymore. Um, by all means, you know, if you have the time and discipline, uh, self-discipline to do everything through, through purely lifestyle and dietary changes fantastic. Uh, and I'm not saying that isn't possible. In a lot of cases, all of these things we're going to be talking about would be resolved by 
optimizing your lifestyle, detoxifying, and giving your body all the building blocks it needs. All of the, you know, steps two, three, and five of the Rejuvenate Blueprint. And all of that is like 100% natural and completely, um, or can be 100% natural and completely nothing to do with anything medical. And if that's, you know, your preferred strategy, then fantastic. But I'm going to be talking to everyone here. And as, you know, on this channel, we're really talking about rejuvenating, meaning to make young again, which hormones are a crucial part of. And we're talking about optimizing. I will also not be leaving out the medical things because they can profoundly work. They can make you feel young again very quickly. They can make you feel, you know, feel and perform in an optimized manner very quickly. And so we will discuss those as well. Beautiful. I do like it when we have those options, which are the lifestyle uh, choices um, options, because then that puts the power into an individual's hands straight away. So yeah, that's and great. like I said, I probably won't go to a lot of lifestyle for all the different hormones because it's all the same stuff every time. You know, it's about getting enough sleep, reducing stress. You know, having a you know plenty of exercise, at least half an hour of walking a day, and all of that stuff that everyone already tells you is the crucial is the key to balancing all those. And if that hasn't worked, then you need to go deeper. You need to okay, is there some kind of toxicity issue that's the problem? Is there some kind of nutritional deficiency is the problem? Is there some kind of chronic infections is the problem? Again, we cover all that in you know the rejuvenate blueprint in in those episodes as to working out why the obvious lifestyle stuff may not be working for you. Uh, but yeah, this episode, we're going to be talking about like how to really fine tune like each specific hormone. Perfect. And so let's kick it off with the first one on the list, which is pregnenolone. Awesome. So pregnenolone is, they call it the master steroid hormone. So do not be afraid of the word steroid. Um, there will be no recommendations for steroids here. Let me just clarify what is usually meant by steroids. Steroids, like they're often, um, you know, the full name is usually anabolic steroids. So these are like Again, fake synthetic things which are testosterone-like, which hit these receptors that have a testosterone-like effect, but often you know, lead to large amounts of muscle growth and stuff like that. I'm not a fan of any of those. Do not recommend them. That's not what we're talking about. So when we say the word steroid, all it means is um, all cholesterol-derived hormones. That's actually what it is. And so cholesterol is a fat that is... You have you you know you may well have in your diet, but it's primarily actually something that's produced by your liver. There's not really much of the depending on who you listen to. There's no or very little correlation between your dietary cholesterol and your your blood cholesterol. Um, we won't go into detail why cholesterol builds up in your blood and stuff like that. We talked about that already in the cardiovascular health episode. But what we do need to know when it comes to male hormones is that your body turns cholesterol into pregnenolone, which is the master steroid hormone. And then pregnenolone, it turns into all the other sex hormones and all the other, uh, hmm, let's say, all the other steroid uh, adrenal hormones like cortisol, which you know, most people have heard of. Um, so all of that ultimately comes from pregnenolone. So I don't think I've seen cases where there is an excess of pregnenolone uh, in men or women, so we won't discuss that. Um, if there is, it's very niche and medical and something that I don't know about. The usual issue is a lack of pregnenolone. And why is there a lack of pregnenolone? The usual issue is because either, and the primary reason is because your body is not converting enough of uh, the cholesterol into pregnenolone. And so often um, you can actually, pregnenolone tests are not that common, but if you have high blood cholesterol, that would be a good indicator to me, and I have seen this confirmed a few times, that you probably have low pregnenolone because your body is not doing that conversion properly. And so what would cause the body to have the low pregnenolone? Uh, so not converting the cholesterol to pregnenolone is the number one reason. Um, and why is that happening? Yes, exactly. Why is that? The, the number one reason for that is a lack of T3, which is your active thyroid hormone, which is why... Before, you know, again, whatever reason, mainstream medicine went in the wrong direction and started only giving out thyroid hormone in very select niche, you know, um, rare cases, when they used to give it out much more appropriately and commonly, the, the main blood tests that they would look at, they would mainly look at just symptoms, but the main blood tests they, they would look at to diagnose low thyroid function and a need for more thyroid support would be high cholesterol. And again and again, I've seen it many, many times. I've seen it myself. I've seen it in many other people. 
You give people the right amount of uh, thyroid hormone and their cholesterol goes down. No change in diet, no change in exercise, no change in anything else, just the right amount of thyroid hormone. And in fact, you know, Ray Pete, who we mention here often, his perspective was if you have high blood cholesterol, you're actually lucky because it means you can handle more thyroid hormone without your cholesterol going too low because cholesterol actually has a protective mechanism on the blood vessels and you know even mainstream science acknowledges they acknowledge that for instance there is so-called good cholesterol hdl which is protective so uh which is part of that overall cholesterol marker so um so yeah so the answer is that's the primary thing and the secondary thing would be um that your body is in a highly stressed inflamed state and it's converting a lot of that pregnant alone to other undesirable things primarily cortisol um, and estrogen and cortisol in estrogen if chronically high will then create a stressed inflamed state and so that's like a vicious circle uh, that's sometimes referred to as a pregnant alone steal not everyone agrees with that which is why i'm giving it as a secondary reason uh, but you know that potentially an issue as well if you see very high cortisol and um and or estrogen you know that could be the cause so generally pregnant alone um is uh, a good thing for men to consider supplementing if they feel in a depleted state, if they are low energy. Um, now, I realize kind of everything I've said is kind of medical, though, again, it depends what country you're in. Pregnant alone is sold as a supplement in, in many countries, as I said, um, but uh, not in mine. And so, you know, teeth, giving thyroid hormone is technically a medicine. Pregnant alone may be a medicine, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, depending on where you're living. Uh, I, you know, I don't know of a natural way to raise pregnant alone um, other than to improve thyroid function by all the natural non-medical means. And like reducing stress would be like probably the primary starting place. So unfortunately, there's no like uh, supplement or herb that I would say would be as effective as either just taking thyroid or taking more pregnant loan to optimize your pregnant loan levels. Right. So ultimately what I'm hearing is if you're not finding or feeling that you're not feeling, but if you're testing and you don't have enough, then really what you could potentially have is high cortisol or potentially high estrogen. And in order to do that, it's, um, the natural way would be to help bring down your stress so that your body can convert that cholesterol more into pregnenolone as long as your thyroid is at a good functioning state. And if it's not, then t um, T3 supplementation or any kind of supplementation hormonal bioidentical hormones for the, your thyroid would be supportive for that uh yeah absolutely okay. that's what i would do in that situation okay beautiful and so then next on the list we have dhea yes so um there's lots of kind of intermediates but the main thing once your body takes pregnant alone um it can turn it into um cortisol it can turn it into progesterone and the whole kind of progesterone family, as it were. Um, and, but if it brings it down the path of creating kind of the primary sexual characteristics hormones, as I call them, uh, testosterone, estrogen, and their metabolites, um, it's bring them down the path of DHEA. So again, if you imagine like there's this raw material, cholesterol, then bring that alone, and then it can go in a few different directions. Your body can go, all right, what do I do with this bring that alone? I could create some progesterone. We'll talk about that in a minute. I could create some cortisol. I don't think we'll talk about that today. <laughs> I could, but, you know, if I want to ultimately create, for instance, some testosterone, which men are interested in, the next thing it will turn into of note is DHEA. Um, and so DHEA is considered like maybe the master sex hormone, whereas pregnenolone is like the master steroid hormone. Um, DHEA has, you know, a lot of benefits in its own right. Uh, we've talked about this before in the previous episodes, uh, but it's, you know, just a, as a very quick recap, it's considered a youth hormone. Um, I actually also consider it a, you know, a mental clarity and mental functioning hormone. Uh, but those are just kind of picking two random things. There's like a a huge amount of different things that DHEA does. And there's a huge amount of benefits that you get if you have DHEA in optimal levels. One of the things, actually, we'll talk about cortisol very quickly, just in relation to DHEA, because uh, 
DHEA is one of the things you can test for reasonably easily, um, the sulfated form of DHEA. And so you often want, you want to look at the, the ratio of DHEA to cortisol. So cortisol is a uh, catabolic um, hormone, which breaks stuff down, but unfortunately, uh, you know, also can lead to uh, putting on fat weight, but it's definitely not going to help you put on muscle uh, cortisol at all. Um, DHEA is an anabolic hormone. So DHEA um, is something that helps to, uh, you know, potentially support the muscle building process, although it's not primary. The, the primary thing would be uh, testosterone for that um, out of all the hormones we're going to talk about today. Um, and so there is definitely research that shows that that ratio will predict all kinds of health outcomes for men and women, uh, like whether you'll drop dead of a you know heart attack or something like that. Like all of these kind of significant diseases, which I probably shouldn't be talking about, um, <laughs> there is a correlation like that the higher your DHEA to cortisol ratio is a very good predictor of all those really negative things not happening to you. And the higher rate of show of cortisol to DHEA puts you at an increased risk for that. So this is definitely something that is worth pursuing uh, optimizing. And if you have low DHA, what kind of symptoms are you experiencing? Uh, probably stress would be the main thing. Um, I don't like, I mean, yeah, potentially, you know, mental fog, premature aging, low energy, but these are kind of things that are hard to quantify in the, the category of everything else that's going on. Uh, but, it, you know, it's the ratio to cortisol. Um, you do sometimes see people who have low levels of both. Uh, that tends to happen with like really quite far advanced fatigue or exhaustion and is fairly unusual. So much more common, I see much more frequently is cortisol is high, DHEA is low in relation to cortisol. And then that's a person who is probably still functioning, but stressed and starting to feel the symptoms of premature aging, whether it's aches and pains, whether it's lines on their face, whether it's, you know, whatever, <laughs> like they're starting to feel old. Um. <laughs> right, right, right. And so then how is somebody going to help, you know, how are they going to increase this? So, you know, lifestyle wise, it's, it's all the stuff that reduces stress, um, which can be as simple as you know behaving differently or can be extremely complex depending on what is actually causing the stress you know if it's a toxin causing a stress or a chronic infection or something it's not always that difficult uh, sorry it's not always that easy it can be difficult to identify and actually resolve it but resolving the root cause of whatever the stress is will definitely bring that back into balance and ditto for any you know specific micronutrient um which is you know important cofactor uh, zinc, magnesium, and B vitamins, you see again and again as important cofactors for a lot of these conversions. And, you know, this is definitely one of them, um, you know, would be another one potentially to look at. And, you know, zinc is commonly deficient in men specifically. Uh, magnesium is commonly deficient in people. Uh, and B vitamins, honestly, in my experience, is commonly deficient in people. Uh, most people, not everyone, but most people benefit from like a general B complex, like a high dose B complex. And probably everyone would benefit from like a low dose B complex. I say it that way because some people um, become, you know, high levels of B vitamins do things and sometimes they can tip someone in the wrong direction. And so it's not always a good idea to take a high dose for everyone. Uh, but like a low dose, like 100% of RDA kind of thing of B vitamins does seem to be helpful for pretty much everyone. And again, would help in that process of helping your body to convert the right amount to DHEA. Um, and then, you know, as I said, uh, more of that pregnenolone will be converted to cortisol rather than DHEA in the presence of stress, uh, inflammation, so you know, getting to the root of those things again. Um, in terms of the other way, the quick way of <laughs> bringing that back into balance, it would be supplementing DHEA. Now, you can do that orally uh, with pills or powders, um, but men, I would say, should actually consider doing it transdermally because when you put DHEA on your skin, so your skin has a lot of um, 5 alpha reductase um uh you know conversion factors there 
And so if you put DHT in your skin, actually it's, it's likely that more of it will convert into DHT, which we'll talk about why that is beneficial later. Um, but so that's a reason to potentially use it on your skin as a man. Um, otherwise, orally, uh, again, depending on the country, that might be available as a supplement or as a drug. If it's a drug, then seek doctor supervision. Um, if it, you're in a country where it's available as a supplement, I also would not use it willy nilly. I would make sure you need it with a blood test before taking it. And then I would test regularly once you take it. I would not actually treat it as, well, I treat it as a supplement as much as vitamin D3, for instance, which I also would not recommend you just take. I recommend that you take, make sure you need it with a blood test and then you make sure you're having the right amount of blood test afterwards. So I put it really in that category. Um, and I would test not just DHA, I'd test the sex hormones because one of the problems is if you're already in a stressed inflamed state, your body might just take that DHEA and it can very easily convert it into estrogen. So you might just increase your estrogen. And that's usually there's a lot of caution around DHEA supplementation specifically. And that is the primary reason for men or women, but especially men, you don't want to convert into estrogen. That's why often it's like low amounts recommended. Again, putting it transdermally, as, as I understand, is the best way to prevent that happening. Um, so that would be you know if if it were me as a man that would be my way of doing it okay yeah because i mean i do think you know sometimes you can just go online oh i'm a bit low on dhea let me go grab a supplement and start taking it so it should be more monitored closely when somebody's deciding that they want to do that if you do that the absolute minimum you should do is then retest and make sure that it's not too much that it's not converting to estrogen and that in fact you still need it and now with any of these uh when uh, we are supplementing with any of these things because our body is supposed to naturally make it is there a risk that by supplementing our body will not make it anymore yes there is that risk with every hormone that you take um and so I don't know, actually, I'm trying to think if pregnant alone, is that an issue? Certainly with everyone except for pregnant alone, let's put it that way, um, maybe. Um, yeah, it's an issue. Your body will downregulate its own production. What is, what? so I don't think there's much uh, controversy about that. What there is more controversy is how long it takes the body to bounce back. And I think there's a lot of misinformation around that. Um, in some cases, you could even say, and I've seen this, you raise it first with a supplement, you take it away. So let's say it's, I'm just going to pick random lab values. Let's say your DHA is at four out of 10. You take a supplement, you bring it up, it gets to nine out of 10. You stop taking it. Three months later, it's down to six out of 10. Like it, it's the body's got used to having it at a higher level. So I have seen that as well. Um, and so I don't think it's always clear, clear cut, but it is definitely a, a risk and a possibility of any kind of supplementation of hormone that your body down regulates some production. Uh, what you, well, it's a certainty your body will down like its own production while you're taking it. What is not certain is how it will respond once you stop. You know, will it start making more of its own because it's used to it now? Will it, yeah, like not? That's something that you don't know. The argument would be for, for doing it and why I think it can actually help to optimize is because of course, you're not just taking DHA or whatever it is to bring one lab value up. You're doing it because you're trying to optimize the function of your body. Because as we talked about, DHA is you know useful for all these different processes in the body. So if you improve the functioning of your body, let's say hypothetically, and then you stop taking something, but your body's overall functioning is improved because you've done lots of good stuff, then your body should be more capable and equipped of making its own optimal levels of DHA. So I don't think it's, it's as simple as people like worry about either it, it it all depends really to me on have you actually optimized things is it a band-aid which you've done nothing to address the root cause and then you just take it away again or is it a band-aid and then you've also gone in and addressed the root cause and now once you remove the band-aid it's kind of healed and your body can make its own again Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, 
guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, You'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Well, fantastic. I think we're going to bring out the big gun now. Here's testosterone. So talk to us about that. Yeah, testosterone. So this is obviously a big one that you know, men are interested in, that men know about. Um, I won't spend too long because we've got a big list here. I think men know the benefits of testosterone, but, you know, uh, obviously there is uh, sex drive, there is confidence, um, there is maybe qualities like assertiveness, although uh, I actually think that aggressiveness is not testosterone. We'll talk about that in a sec uh, if you want. Uh, but certainly assertiveness and confidence um, there is obviously muscle, and that would be often, you know, the number one reason that men are interested in raising testosterone. I don't know. Young men, the number one reason is muscle. Older men, the number one reason usually is sexual performance. Uh, but it's usually one of those two. Uh, it doesn't just help to increase muscle mass. It also helps to reduce the percentage of fat, like body fat. So, you know, it has that dual benefit. Um, and then, you know, to some degree, it also controls your level of masculine traits like uh, having a deep voice, uh, being able to grow beards, uh, you know, having broad shoulders, all of that kind of, all of that masculine stuff. Now I say to some degree, because um, we could talk about DHT now actually, Chrissy, just like, uh, you know, as a way of contrasting okay. with testosterone. Yeah, let's so, do that. Because I mean, sometimes people would also consider like um, hair loss, but I know we've discussed hair loss and that's a big part of DHT as well. So I think, yeah, let's, let's bring them both in together. Yes, um, <laughs> I get lots of comments to one of my videos about DHT uh, about that. Um, you know, funnily enough, I you know I was interviewing a, what I consider an expert on DHT. Uh, he has a full head of hair and he has high DHT levels. I have male pattern, male pattern baldness and I've had chronically low DHT levels my whole life uh, because I have a genetic tendency and because you know I went through a lot of stress and health issues uh, earlier in my life um, due to you know. <laughs> being an idiot, <laughs> taking lots of drugs and eating a poor quality diet and all that kind of stuff when I was younger. Um, and so I don't think it's as clear cut as high DHT leads to male pattern baldness. Um, I mean, we talked about this. I think we should link people to the video because, you know, it's quite an in-depth uh, uh, like explanation as to why, because you have to kind of debunk a lot of the, the mainstream perspective. But let's talk about DHT. So does it lead to hair loss? Uh, possibly, even if it did though, I would say optimizing as in raising levels of DHT for men is 100% a good idea and worth it because DHT is the primary androgenic hormone in the body, whereas testosterone is the primary anabolic hormone in the body. What's the difference? Anabolic, um, in the case of testosterone anyway, means muscle building. Anabolic kind of literally means to build up, but in the case of testosterone, it's very much talking about muscle, not fat. Uh, estrogen is also anabolic, but it's more fat building. So testosterone is number one and anabolic muscle building hormone in the body, but DHT is the number one androgenic hormone in the body. What does androgenic mean? It means masculine or male making. So masculine traits come primarily 
from DHT, actually not testosterone. And so um, I think there's been a bit of a, either a massive mistake or possibly like a psyop or conspiracy theory around this. Um, there's an argument to be made that back in the day when the people who ruled us, there was lots of rival factions all fighting each other for power, that it made sense that you'd want to boost the masculinity of your uh, the men in your tribe, army, whatever, country, because that would help them to win wars against other uh, rival elites that you're you know trying to win. But since they've had like a plan for a one world government where we're all controlled from a centralized place, suddenly masculinity doesn't seem so desirable anymore. It seems like if you're trying to control the whole population from one centralized place, then suddenly the toxic masculinity, which has been encouraged in the male population for thousands of years and glorified and encouraged and all of that kind of stuff, suddenly it's become demonized. It's the exact opposite. Uh, you know, so you used to have like, you know, Vikings and Sparta and, you know, uh, leave, leave the young boy out and, and, and to fight wars. And if he survives, he's a real man and all this kind of like crazy over the top masculinity. And now it's like if you raise your voice a little bit, then you are, you know, unbearably overly masculine or whatever. It, it's It's gone in a very extreme other direction. So I won't talk any more about, you know, societal stuff, but. That's my very abbreviated version of, you know, why I, I believe uh, DHT has been demonized. I think it goes hand in hand with the demonization of masculinity uh, full stop. Um, I actually don't also believe that DHT or testosterone lead to aggressiveness or violence, which of course is the primary objection to masculinity. What do you is, think does lead to that? Estrogen. Okay. And why? Um, well, you know, the, the, one of the problems um, of testosterone is that it excess amounts, and this is the problem with people, especially on anabolic steroids or whatever, um, is that they actually become very over-estrogenized. That's why often they have to take aromatase inhibitors. They have to prevent that over-estrogenization. Um, estrogen is a stress hormone. Um, that works with and heightens the effects of cortisol and adrenaline, which are obviously fight or flight chemicals. Whereas testosterone and especially DHT um, are actually, they more hit the calming neurotransmitters like GABA, which promotes peace and relaxation and tranquility. Now they also to some degree, hit dopamine, and dopamine is goal-oriented behavior. And so I don't think it's quite as simple as to say, you know, I'm not saying that testosterone and DHT makes you peaceful and estrogen makes you aggressive, but I am saying um, that I think the excessive kind of um, like hyper-emotional type of aggressiveness, which, you know, often relates to, you know, bullying and stuff like that, is more due to that excessive... Uh, conversion, uh, but it's but it's coupled with the um, the testosterone as well. So the testosterone does make you confident and assertive, right? And so if you're thinking, well, why why do women not have that? Well, you know this is complicated as well. Like women actually, you know, for instance, you know, statistics show that um, women are twice as likely to physically assault, hit a child than a man. Like, so a mother is twice as likely to do it as a father. So it's not true that, you know, women are innately less violent than men or females than males. And in fact, in the few species where the male, where the females are bigger than the males, I think hyenas is one example, you know, the spiders or whatever, the females are very aggressive, <laughs> very violent, you know, very dominating. So um, it's not necessarily true that, you know, women are less violent, but I think, male violence is more focused on justifiably because, you know, men, because of the testosterone, are significantly stronger. So when they are violent, it has significantly more of a dangerous, life-threatening impact. So I think it is justifiable, you know, I, I know this isn't always popular, but it's true that a man hitting a woman in a relationship is worse than a woman hitting a man, <laughs> uh, even though maybe the woman hitting the man is more common these days just because the man can do more damage. 
because of the testosterone. And so I think, um, uh, yeah, so that combination of the assertiveness and the confidence of the testosterone, plus if you add then the aggressiveness um, and the emotionality of the estrogen is a very dangerous combination. And so if you take, you know, like a, a high testosterone male where maybe they're stressed and inflamed and a lot of it is also converting to estrogen or they're taking steroids or whatever, that, that is well, there you know, was a, a very... common common thing that they'd say roid rage. I mean, that's... Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that is a dangerous combination. Um, however, true masculinity to me is not really that. It's more of like your, your John Wayne, your Gary Cooper, your James Bond. It's like actually staying very calm and relaxed and uh unfazed centered yeah centered despite all kind of stuff and, and yes being capable of violence and all the rest of it but only in when it's really really necessary you know in the role of protector or whatever it might be and so being very emotionally reactive like someone just looks at you and you're trying to start a fight with them or whatever that kind of stuff that we think of if we think about excess masculinity that's not really masculine because if you have very high levels of DHT, you have a lot of uh, GABA agonism going on. You have a lot of that calming effect going on. And so when it comes to testosterone, um, it you know there's this path called 5-alpha reductase, which converts it to DHT. And there's this path called, uh, usually referred to as aromatase, that converts it to estrogen. And often the testosterone testosterone goes down one path or another. I mean, obviously, it, it's always going into both, but it will tend to prefer one path or another. And again, if you're inflamed and stressed and cortisol is high and all the rest of it, it's more likely to go down the estrogen path. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't know if this answers the question why I don't associate... Um, yeah, no, it definitely does. It definitely does. Um, I want to... And I know what I just said is controversial and it's not mainstream science um, and I can provide studies to back it up, but, it, it, you know, it's not universally agreed upon uh by any means um but this is my my take on it and um you know <clears throat> there's all kinds of stuff that like there's this belief that you know men are innately violent and women aren't um yeah i remember seeing a thing recently about like oh if if, if women are in charge there'd be no wars and then someone did the study and they looked at all kings and queens for our history and statistically when there was a queen in charge there was significantly more war started than when there was a king in charge. So, like, th this idea um, that, you know, that, that, that masculinity is innately violent, um, I don't think is actually accurate. I think both men and women are capable of it. I agree just with as, that. Both just men as and women. both men and women are capable of having high levels of estrogen. Exactly. Like, and there's that thing that <laughs> most men by the age of, uh, you know, 40s are actually have as high or higher estrogen than their wives. And I remember seeing, you know, I think many years ago before I learned anything about hormones, like this um, uh, uh, this philosopher was saying, it's interesting that testosterone is blamed for war, and yet all the people starting wars are old men, which is usually true, yeah? That over 60, often even over 80-year-old men are the ones usually who are, you know, orchestrating all these wars behind the scenes. They're the generals. Um, and what's going on? Are there many men that age who have high levels of DHT or high levels of testosterone? Not, but they're all going to have high levels of estrogen by that point, you know. So anyway, I realize, you know, none of this is going to be conclusive to someone who's very determined to not believe it. Uh, but these are avenues of, you know, the concepts. consideration. Yeah, concepts yeah. of things, yeah. To, things to consider and to look into. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to testosterone and DHT, what's going to cause those to be low? Um, so first of all, an excess of conversion to estrogen, as we've just discussed, which again, you know, uh, inflammation, uh, inflammation and um, uh, stress being the you know the primary things that are going to send in that direction. Uh, toxicity as well, but again, toxicity causes inflammation. So we could just simplify it to estrogen and stress. Uh, a lack of the nutritional cofactors. So again, talking about uh, zinc and the B vitamins, uh, especially. Uh, and magnesium again, all of those would be, uh, you know, super important. Um, it, if there's like a general lack of sex hormones, which you sometimes see, like low levels of testosterone and estrogen, it can be uh, because of 
like the cortisol steel that we were talking about earlier, too much of it is being converted to testosterone and there's not enough left for, you know, converting it into DHEA, testosterone um, and estrogen. And then in terms of DHT, to answer that specific aspect of your question, um, so not in that case, it's not just converting to estrogen instead of DHT, although that's a possibility. It's also because people are um, having a lot of exogenous outside exposure to estrogens, um, which again will push people more in that direction. And then these days people are voluntarily um, taking 5-alpha reductase inhibitors on purpose just to keep their hair, which to me is, and, and sometimes for, you know, more serious medical reasons related to the prostate, which again, I talked about in a different episode, but again, to me, um, DHT causes a, a little, has a bit of an anabolic effect, so it can lead to a little bit of uh, increase the size of the prostate. Estrogen has a very anabolic swelling effect and leads to a lot of growth of the prostate. So again, I would look more estrogen for that, but that's something um, you know we discussed in that separate episode. Um, but most of it is people just trying not to lose their hair, which to me is um, insane um, as a as a value judgment. So to remove the thing that makes you feel confident, assertive. Uh, it's also sex, you know, like like the, the primary um, thing that gives you your sex drive and ability to perform sexually Yeah, your ability to perform, yeah. Is actually yeah. DHT, not testosterone. The people are like, well, if that's true, why does testosterone help? Because your body can and does convert testosterone to DHT. But again, DHT is the primary androgenic, so that's masculine qualities, including sexual ability. Uh, like penis size is, for instance, even is largely determined by the level of DHT during the teenage years where like the penis suddenly grows. Like everything masculine about you, uh, the deep voice, we talked about the beard, all of that kind of stuff, mu you know, everything other than uh, muscles is more to do with uh, DHT than testosterone. And then so uh, if somebody is low in either of those, then what are the potential natural ways to increase it or is it going to be the same as everything else it's all the usual stuff yeah especially you know sleep uh you know because testosterone uh, builds up again during sleep you know re re reducing stress uh but yeah it, it's it's kind of all the usual uh you know i mentioned vitamin d3 is another in terms of nutrient as another important nutrient uh, when it comes to testosterone. But yeah, it's all the usual stuff when it comes to natural. And then as far as bioidentical, should for somebody, if they're low in both, should they supplement both or should they just supplement with one? What should they do in that situation? This is a good question. This is often why I get even doctors reach out to me and asking about, about how to actually manage this. Um, so it's interesting. Even if a doctor is happy, ready and willing to prescribe DHT, it seems like there's like, again, this you know, conspiracy or whatever it is goes pretty far. Now, for those who are like, it's not a conspiracy, I mean, it's because DHT is bad and it makes your hair fall out, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but there's all kinds of way worse stuff that has way worse side effects profile, that has way less benefits that is routinely compounded by pharmacies. So that's why even if you think DHT is bad, I don't believe that's all it is. Um, but anyway, so, the, you know, so it's pretty hard to get it on prescription. So really you're looking at testosterone now this is interesting because i looked into this uh recently for someone in in great depth uh because they're like a <laughs> platinum client and uh they're like a whatever it takes and so i really went into it and i was actually surprised it's not something i had a strong opinion about before because i just hadn't gone into it so when you look at trt um the usual thing that you're told is the best form is injectable trt and uh, like some kind of modified form, uh, you know, sip, uh, sipionate or something like that. And, you know, the better thing to do is to inject it frequently rather than giving yourself like a, a huge dose once every two weeks or something, which they used to do and sometimes they still do to save money. It's much better to take it like three times a week, something like that. So your body kind of has a more natural amount. Um, and consistent and as well, correct? Because otherwise it's just going to taper off and taper down. Yeah. Yeah, it'll start at like 300 milligrams and then like crash you know, by the end of two weeks. It's completely inconsistent. It is kind of crazy that some people are still doing it that way. But it's because people don't want to be, you know, inject themselves frequently. I understand that. So it's purely for practical reasons is my understanding of why they do it and, and cost. 
um, which I guess is practical. Uh, but, you know, the other two methods, which they usually say are not as good, is either transdermal and um, oral. So we talk about oral first. Uh, it's true, like, your body, um, like, oral forms generally, like, they put a stress on the liver. Uh, sometimes they're not very well absorbed. They're not as reliable. They don't raise blood cell levels as reliably. I've seen, like, another company recently that's really pushing their oral form, which they say is working very well, and they're selling it alongside pregnenolone and something else. I think in that, uh, I think it's a aromatase inhibitor, although I can't remember. But generally, anyway, the overall TRT consensus is usually that the oral is the least good form. So what about topical, transdermal, putting it in your skin? Well, um, what I'd seen about that is, first of all, it's not super well absorbed. So the advantage of injecting it is if you're injecting 100 milligrams, 100 milligrams is going to end up in your bloodstream. Whereas if you put a transdermal cream on, if you put 100 milligram transdermal cream on, maybe only 10 or 20 milligrams is going to end up in your bloodstream. So that's, you know, considered inefficient. Um, and then second of all, it's a little bit unreliable, like it doesn't as reliably raise your levels. Uh, maybe there's issues as well of, you know, you've got your skin, you rub it off on someone else, like your wife, who really shouldn't have that high dose of testosterone. So there's those kind of practical issues. So again, the transdermal is generally not uh, considered to be the best for men. Although when women have bioidentical hormones, they usually do give cream. Um, but it's such a low dose, it's like a milligram a day usually, or something like that, that they give to women or less. Um, whereas in men, transdermally, the, you know, the, the body optimally will create about 10 milligrams a day itself. So, you know, you have to give kind of 50 plus milligrams a day transdermal to, to make up for that. But here's what's really interesting. I discovered that one of the reasons why it's not super reliable to use transdermal is because your body converts a certain amount of it to DHT. It's Again, it's the same thing. It's the uh, five alpha reductase, which there's high levels of in your skin, which will mean that you know a decent amount of it is actually converted to DHT. So, my, like based on that and all, uh, seeing like a lot of looking at a lot of different studies about it, is that that's especially high in the scrotal reason, those five alpha reductase um, uh, enzyme activity. And so these days, probably my favorite type of TH, TRT that I'd recommend to people, again, based on all the studies, is scrotal application of transdermal um, TRT. And that is because um, all the studies I showed just show like it works. It significantly really raises the T levels, the testosterone levels to an optimal place once you've got the right dose. And it will raise your DHT levels to an optimal place as well. Like, and then it means that you don't actually need to take extra DHT as well, which is so hard to get hold of. Let's say if your body has an issue converting testosterone to DHT in general, it won't have an issue if you apply it in that way. So currently, until someone shows me you know, enough research that this is not the case, that <laughs> I'm always open to learning, but currently... If I had to do it, that would be how I would do it um, because it seems to be the the best possible outcome. And then also, you know, on a practical level, again, you'd have to inject yourself several times a week, which most people don't want to do and all that kind of stuff. So it, it does have that benefit as well. Fantastic. So a lot to unpack in that one. And um, with that, as we were stating previously about if somebody is supplementing, that the body's production would go down. With this, with testosterone and DHT, is this something that somebody would have to stay on permanently? So I've kind of updated, again, looking at research, my understanding of that as well. Um, it doesn't have to be permanent. You can stop these things. It's just that um, it won't bounce back overnight, you know? Like with thyroid, you know, uh, Ray Peake talked about it, but the more I look into it and actually have tried it myself, cycling on and off thyroid, I do believe he's correct that your body like rebounds very quickly within a few days if it's capable. Uh, I think the rebound for testosterone like is a, f you know, we're talking months, maybe a month, maybe two, maybe three. Now, unless you help, then it is possible to help. So I think we're talking about luteinizing hormone and uh, follicle stimulating hormones next or very soon. Um, so 
those are the pituitary hormones that tell your body to make more testosterone. Um, and so you can take something to like kick, like increase the levels of that. But yeah, if you're on, if you're on testosterone, your levels of FHH and LH is going to go right down, you know, right, probably even below the reference range, maybe to zero or close to it. Um, and so if you just stop taking testosterone, don't do anything to raise those again. Um, it probably will take several months, but your body will like go back to making its own. Um, but if you do something to raise those again, you can potentially kickstart your own production again pretty quickly. And, you know, if you're young and healthy, like I know Hans and Moto, who we interviewed recently, he did an experiment with this where he took a very large amount and then stop. And his experience, you know, he said was, uh, you know, his production came back very quickly, but he is young and healthy. Yeah, age is something to take into consideration. But yeah, since you mentioned the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone, let's go to that next. Yeah. So basically, uh, this is usually more pay attention is paid to for women. I'm going to keep it simple with men. Uh, basically, this is your pituitary, so it's your brain uh, telling your testicles to produce more uh, testosterone. That would be like the simple way of just saying it. One of them is testosterone. One of this. One of them is more you know focused on sperm, um, but you know they're, they're very much interrelated. So basically, if your levels are low, uh, but not you know completely low, not suppressed, that's generally the healthy thing. If they're high, it means that your body is struggling to make enough. And so it's like your your brain has got its foot on the uh, gas accelerator saying, you know, make more, we don't have enough. Um, so generally, it being very high is a sign that your body's struggling to make enough. It being very low is a sign that you're probably taking testosterone. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you generally want it like lower end of the reference range. And so, yeah, um, some herbs, you know, will increase this. Um, Quickly, before we move on, let me ask you this. If you have low FSH and LH and low T, then what? Yeah, it can happen. And this is the same thing that we talk about with the thyroid, where just because you have low TH, TSH doesn't necessarily mean you have enough thyroid hormone. You could also... Um, so generally the only thing that normal doctors would test is TSH, which is your brain saying make more thyroid hormone. And if that is low or normal, they go, eh, you're okay. But that's not always true. You could also have low thyroid hormone. So what you just said is the you know, male hormone equivalent of that. What if your brain is not telling your uh your other gland, in this case the testicles, to make more, um, and yet you don't have high levels? Um, so there's a few reasons for that. Could be that a lot of it is being converted to estrogen um, and the brain hasn't caught up for that. But of course, it would be, you know, what they call hypopituitary. So it's not just, it's like, even though if you were to only look at the um, LH and FSH like they do with thyroid, you might think, oh, this is fine. Uh, usually they don't do that with sex hormones, so they would actually see it. Um, but then basically it's like, it's not you have zero problems, you actually have two problems. Number one problem is that, uh, the testicles are not producing enough. And then number two problem is that the brain is not working correctly to tell them to create more. Uh, you know, that's really what would be going on there. Okay. And so then as you were just about to go into, what are the natural ways potentially to increase that? Um, so a lot of herbs will raise this, um, you know, the typical male herbs to various degrees, like you know, tonkatali, uh, tribulus, uh, horny goat weed, um, all of those kind of herbs, uh, you know, I have a business where we have uh, a lot of formulas that, you know, work on these different levels called, you know, the new alpha.com. Uh, it's not kind of my business. I'm the one who does the formulations, let's put it that way. Um, and then I have another business also where I do the formulations and that's, you know, a lot of what we're focused on. Actually, we're focused on a few different things, you know, sometimes we're focusing on stopping the conversion to estrogen. Sometimes we're focused on, uh, you know, improving levels of free testosterone. Sometimes we're focused on promoting, you know, causing the correct conversion of testosterone to DHT, all of that kind of stuff, um, all stuff we're going to talk about today. Um, sometimes we're focused on lowering prolactin. But, um, you know, one of the primary things we are focused on is getting your body to make its own testosterone. And so often the mechanism why bits, uh, whereby those herbs work is raising the level of FSH and LH. Uh, the medical approach would be uh, taking something like uh, Clomid, 
which is usually more when doctors prescribe it, it's more commonly prescribed for women for the same purpose. It's like just as the, um, you know, in men, it increases sperm production and testicular uh, function in women. It uh, stimulates the ovaries and um, that's why it's you know, follicle stimulating hormone. Um, it stimulates the ovaries to release more eggs. So if you're trying to get pregnant, um, you can, you know, ramp up your chances of that happening by taking Clomid. But a lot of like bodybuilders and all those kind of people who will go to any lengths to raise testosterone one way or another, you know, Clomid is one of the strategies that they use for that. And also it's one of the strategies they use to recover if they've been abusing steroids or whatever to try and kickstart that natural production again. Uh, there are other ones, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, you know, Clomid is probably the most well-known. So that's like the medical uh, medical option. Perfect. And always, uh, you know, finding the right doctor, working with them, testing, checking, and making sure that you're on the right track. Yep. Perfect. So the next one that we have on our list today is estrogen. Um, and do men also, and forgive me for my ignorance here as well, because I know women have estradiol. Do men have estradiol as well, or is it just estrogen? So estrogen and estradiol are the same thing. Uh Kind of, uh, I mean, there's there's many different forms of estrogen. Is it eleven something like that? But usually, there's three main ones that are focused on that are actually tested. And estradiol is the most uh, active form. Like it 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 affects the receptors the strongest, and so that's generally uh, the only one that's tested in most cases. Sometimes they also test estrone and estriol, which are weaker forms of uh, estrogen they hit those receptors less hard they have different functions in different ways um but that's not really super relevant to men <laughs> i think it's more relevant to women um so yeah when we say estrogen generally we mean estradiol we mean that strongest most commonly tested form of uh, estrogen and yes as i was saying earlier not only do they have it uh beyond a certain age they often have more of it than women because the older you get as a man, generally the more stressed and inflamed and unhealthy you get, and so more and more of your testosterone is converted to estrogen. Whereas as a woman, once you're kind of pre-menopausal and beyond into menopausal, your body massively down-regulates your production of estrogen. So that's the thing that, where they say that by your mid-40s, often the men actually have more estrogen than women, and certainly by your 60s, uh, it would be unless, you know, if neither of you were having any kind of... Um, bioidentical hormones it'd be shocking if the woman had more estrogen than the men like the, the men will very consistently uh have more so so with that let me ask you then because if it is a stress hormone but it's so down regulated in women but it's going up and up for men but let's say a woman is just as stressed does that mean she's going to have more of the uh, you know cortisol and more of the adrenal stress hormones in that way uh yeah it's um you know, it's a ratio thing. So the primary thing, the primary hormone that men have to oppose estrogen is testosterone, even though, as I said, one converts to the other. Um, the primary hormone that women have to oppose estrogen is progesterone. So even though estrogen does really crash for women uh, at, mon at and after menopause compared to what it was at the peak, like the teens and 20s, um, it's the estrogen is still high in relation to progesterone. So progesterone crashes first and it crashes harder. Um, and so while a man might have a lot more estrogen than a woman by the time um, they're both, let's say, 60, um, the man will still have a fair amount at least, maybe not a great amount or an optimal amount, but a fair amount of testosterone to oppose it, whereas the woman might have no progesterone to oppose it. And so that's really the challenge. So it's not about the absolute level. It's, you know, it's often about ratios. And so that's really the problem. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And then, so with the estradiol, um, um, obviously we're figuring out that it's not something that we want to increase. So are there things here where we think about decreasing it? Um, so it's interesting you know, part of our, like, part of the communities I'm part of really demonize estrogen. Like, there's no such thing as a good estrogen, um, especially the Ray P community. They're really against it. I've heard, like, statements say, like, estrogen is not the female hormone at all. And I don't agree with that. I, I My understanding is it does increase uh, feminine traits, just like testosterone and more DHT increases masculine traits. Um, it just hap so happens it is also a stress hormone. 
Um, and so this is, you know, to do with the way that uh, reproduction happens for women specifically. It's just an unfortunate reality that a stress hormone is necessary to create the environment for uh, conception to occur. Um, and also that it, you know, creates the, the traits which are, you know, considered attractive in women to a reasonably large degree. And also um, that you know, make women feel sexually receptive. So it's like, it is both a stress hormone and an essential part of the um, the continuation of the species. And even in men, it's not as clear cut to say that it's not beneficial. There is definitely, for instance, um, research that shows that the men that have the least chance of erectile dysfunction is men who have high testosterone and high to medium estrogen. And that low estrogen, even in the... Um, even with high testosterone can often lead to not lack of sex drive, but a lack of ability to actually perform sexually. And so I think this really relates to, so testosterone is the drive or the aggressive, not violent, but as in, you know, I'm going to pursue it no matter what kind of drive for sex. But estrogen is actually the receptivity to sex. So it's almost like yang and yin. And both are actually necessary in both sexes for them to really, in the case of women, it's more that for them to really enjoy sex. In the case of men, it's for them to even be able to have sex. And so, again, a lot of the, the people on the outskirts of this, like the bodybuilders and all those kind of people, they, they know what I'm saying is true because a lot of them will, like, you know, take estrogen blockers, aromatase inhibitors, and they you know if your estrogen gets too low, then... Uh, your sex drive doesn't go down, but your ability to get an erection just, you know, can completely disappear, can completely crash. So um, I would say actually estrogen in the, how would I say, kind of, so uh, just just below the mid-level of the reference range is probably optimal for men. Again, it's a bit of a judgment call because if, if health is all you care about, then maybe lower on the reference range would be better. But if you also care about sex, uh, then I would have it more than bid. So you can make your kind of judgment uh, based on that. Um, so, yeah, it's not as clear cut. And I'm sure estrogen has other benefits in men, um, but that's the only one that I am that I'm aware of off the top of my head right now. But, of course, to most men, it's extremely significant. So don't just try and get your estrogen as low as possible if you're a man. Or if you do, be aware that that's definitely a potential side effect. Right. There are risks with that. So then if a gentleman, if someone does have low estrogen and they're struggling with those things that you just discussed, then what would be the ways that they would be able to raise it either naturally or would they or, you know, supplement? I love because it's, it's, I don't think it's ever an issue unless you've been messing with your hormones and made that happen. That's, that's the thing. Like your body's always doing that conversion of testosterone to estrogen so the only reason you'd ever have such an extremely high ratio of testosterone to estrogen is because you're messing with it. So, you know, stop or reduce the aromatase inhibitors, stop or reduce the <laughs> polysteroids. Like that's probably what's going to be causing that situation in the vast majority of issues. Otherwise, it's a, a medical condition that definitely, you know, it's an unusual thing that you should see a doctor about. So, yeah, despite everything I just said, I wouldn't actually recommend anything to raise estrogen. I just I'm just saying I wouldn't like be taking stuff, even if it's herbs, you know, to try and reduce it as much as possible because you can reduce it too much. Beautiful. And now we're going to move on to the next one on our list, the lovely progesterone, as you were just discussing for us beautiful women, how much of a role it plays in our cycle. How about for men? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Again, it's amazing how little research there is about progesterone. Um, I think a consensus has appeared these days about how much progesterone certainly a woman is supposed to make, but I've heard people claim that it's completely wrong. And, you know, the evidence for that is that women feel a lot better if they supplement with a lot more. And so at least a woman who's functioning optimally, you'd think that they would be producing the amount that women feel good at when they're supplementing it if they need it. Um, but anyway, so progesterone... In the same way that women have much less testosterone, but they still need it and feel better when they have the right amount for them. So for women, it's more to do with sex drive, confidence, assertiveness, things like that. Um, for men, progesterone still has a lot 
of benefits. Um, primarily, it's anti-stress. That's the main reason why a woman would want it. Uh, sorry, sorry, why a man would want it. We did a whole episode with um, uh, Dr. Michael Platt on adrenaline dominance, and it's his number one recommendation for both men and women if they have excess adrenaline, which usually goes hand in hand with excess cortisol, if they have ADHD and all, uh, digestive issues, all of that kind of stuff. And certainly, if you have uncontrolled dangerous growth, um, testosterone, you know, is not opposing estrogen enough, and I would consider adding in progesterone for that reason. So there's a lot of potential benefits for progesterone for men. Now, having said that, and as safe as it is, um, I feel like it, it as I said earlier, it's kind of often the balance of these hormones that's key rather than the absolute levels. So no matter how stressed they are, I never recommend progesterone to a man who has low testosterone. Um, is like, that because it will inhibit testosterone more? More just like the ratio of progesterone to testosterone. Um, I wouldn't want testosterone to be even lower in relation to another sex hormone. Um, and yes, you know, it can potentially reduce masculine traits further to have that progesterone higher in ratio. Um, so I'd want the testosterone to be high first. But if the testosterone is high, ideally the DHT is also high, and they are still having excess stress or excess uncontrolled growths, um, then I would be happy to look at progesterone as you know another um, avenue to help to address those things. And in fact, it's generally not used medically for stress, but it is sometimes used medically for those uncontrolled growths. So uh, despite them not admitting that estrogen is a primary cause of prostate growth, um, they do sometimes prescribe progesterone for prostate growth, uh, even though, you know, progesterone obviously antagonizes and reduces the estrogen buildup in the prostate. So um, th there is that awareness that it's not the most commonly used, the most commonly used is DHT blockers and um, anti-inflammatories, but it is sometimes used progesterone. I wish it was used more often. I was going to say, because I just had a thought, when I, the last episode that we just did, yeah, you were talking about um, supplementation with T3 has had um, more effectiveness of treating depression. It's like seeing and hearing you talk about instead of those other blockers that you just mentioned, forgive me, I can't remember the word, but taking progesterone to support in this way. It's like, hey, let's let's think about this in, a, in another avenue that could have more beneficial effects. For stress and anxiety, yes, 100%. So yeah, depression and anxiety, the two, anxiety, stroke, stress are like the two biggest mental health issues by far that almost everyone these days thinks they're suffering from at least one or the two, it seems. Um, yeah, depression, I would say is a T3 deficiency. And then anxiety is either, a, in the case of the men, DHT, testosterone deficiency. In the case of both, you know, a progesterone deficiency. Is it as simple as that? No, of course not. There's loads of things going on. But in terms of how you could potentially treat it in a way that's relatively safe, relatively harmless, um, and very effective, you could think of it that way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so then as far as um, progesterone, again, it's going to be the same kind of lifestyle things to increase it, I'm assuming? Uh, yes, like, you know, stress would be the, like the cortisol steal again, more of it's going to be converted to cortisol, less into progesterone and stuff like that. Um, I don't think there are many men who are like trying to increase progesterone naturally. So I don't think there's been a lot of research in it. But it, yeah, it'll be all the same things because it, it does work on women all the same things yeah and then there is just you know the the reality that in time your body creates less of that stuff there's a very obvious correlation with progesterone levels going down with age with women as we talked about i don't think there's actually even been the research in what it is in men um it's you know acknowledges the fact that men definitely produce progesterone i don't think it's been researched if it goes down with age uh, but I'm sure it does based on my, uh, you know, understanding and experience. Um, but yeah, there's so little research in the topic of men and progesterone. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. 
Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. So this next one on the list, I know we've had a few discussions on it in some of our other episodes, and this is prolactin. So talk to us about prolactin, Owen. Yeah, so in a nutshell, um, a lot of the things that were considered to be like really bad about estrogen, um, some of those have now been blamed on prolactin instead. And I think there's a lot of, you know, accuracy, accuracy to that. Um, the uncontrolled growth of estrogen, I think is, I stick with that being estrogen um, and the aggressiveness I've talked about. Uh, I also will stick to that being estrogen, but prolactin, so prolactin is a hormone that opposes dopamine. That's the primary thing uh, about it. And yes, it also can lead to feminine traits. Um, but specifically, so prolactin, it's called because it's pro, um, you know, it's affirming and then lactin is as in lactation, just as progesterone is progestating. That's you know, where that originally came from. Um, so prolactin was discovered because it is the thing that goes super, super high when you're breastfeeding as a woman. Um, and for a while, that's what it was thought of as that's what it does. And then, you know, recently, relatively recently in, in biochemistry and medical science, they're looking at, oh, men seem to have quite a lot. And, oh, it seems to have quite a big impact on them. And so there's still a lot of research in that, um, you know, going on in that regard. So it opposes dopamine. So dopamine is the primary uh, motivation uh, chemical that you have in your body. That, you know, they used to think of it as pleasure, but it's more like it's it's motivation, drive, enthusiasm, passion, all of those kind of words. Um, the thing that gives you energy and makes you want things and try and get them. So that's dopamine. And so um, prolactin really suppresses it. So we talked a bit about, you know, depression. I mean, I would say prolactin strongly correlates with depression because it's reducing it's opposing that level of dopamine, which to me, dopamine is, if you're going to put it down to any one neurotransmitter, which is always tricky, then I'd say lack of dopamine is depression. Because if you're full of enthusiasm and passion and motivation, you're hardly depressed, right? Like they really are <laughs> antithetical to each other. Um, so prolactin, you know, uh, one of the things, if it's very high in men, it can lead to gynecomastia, which is man boobs. Um, and if it gets bad enough, men can even start lactating. Um, so, you know, that's an obvious feminine trait, lactation, uh, that men can have if they have enough prolactin in their system. Um, and so, you know, lack of motivation, you know, low energy or any other one, potentially depression. Um, uh, I know we're not talking about women here, but I, I have a lot of sympathy for what women have to go through to produce the next generation. Um, and I know there's a lot of joy involved as well, but, you know, I've talked to a lot of women who really struggle to recover after you know, giving birth. And I do think hyperlactin is one of the reasons, um, because it is, it really suppresses your, and it makes sense. Like, should you be on the go trying to achieve things when you've just given birth and you have a small helpless baby to look after? No, you know, like the suppression of dopamine is obviously on purpose from a, a nature point of view. It's trying to get you to, you know, not be on the go. It's trying to get you to stay, relatively still and, and and feed the baby and rest and recover and relax and all that kind of stuff in theory but in reality it makes a lot of women feel depressed and there's this you know uh what do they call it the um, postpartum thank you yeah uh, you know after giving birth is very common and all the rest of it so men can have a kind of version of that um where they don't feel good and so with prolactin with men we're almost exclusively looking to lower it. The other thing that's famous about prolactin for men is it raises after orgasm, specifically ejaculation, and it is the rate limiting factor in being able to go again. So if your prolactin is super low as a man, 
then you're the kind of man who, you know, maybe five minutes later, you'll be right ready to go again. And conversely, if your prolactin is super high, you might need several days or even longer to recover before you're able to go again. So, you know, that's often why men are focused on prolactin and why they want to lower it um, as well. Yeah, and so, you know, what causes hyperlactin? Obviously, other than low dopamine, but what causes that? So generally, if you see hyperlactin, you're thinking stress um, and you're thinking maybe low thyroid function. Those would be the you know, two things that would be maybe more likely to be root causes if a man has it. Right. And what would be the um, best ways for a man to lower the prolactin if it's high? Yeah. So, you know, reducing stress and addressing low thyroid function to, to go back to that. Um, but other than that, you know, the anything generally prolactin is lowered by focusing on raising dopamine, you know, pretty much exclusively. So there's a bunch of nutrients that, uh, you know, are supposed to help, uh, like raising vitamin E is one example, uh, you know, tyrosine or macuna, which contains L-dopa, which is the precursor to dopamine are commonly used. Vitamin B6 is commonly recommended. Um, but, you know, uh, in, and then there's herbs as well, which, you know, will work to some degree. Ashwagandha is the one that I've seen that has the most actual uh, scientific, you know, evidence that it is uh, effective. But, you know, there are others that claim to work on it as well. Um, and, uh, you know, medically, usually what's given is strong uh, dopamine agonists. And dopamine agonists are always risky, first of all, in terms of addiction. So, you know, a very strong dopamine agonist, for instance, is methamphetamine. And honestly, the drugs that they give you to lower prolactin are not a million miles away from that. Um, so there's the danger of addiction and there's the danger of withdrawal. So meaning, you know, your body down regulates dopamine. As we talked about in great detail in a previous episode, it's very hard to raise dopamine because your body will just try and lower it again so kind of other more novel things which like increase your level of dopamine without being obvious agonists seem to be better to me um like bromantane which we've talked about before that would be a good candidate for it um and then potentially as well the uh, the non uh psychedelic ergo derivatives like uh metagoline and lyceride I would say probably, and again, this is not me just making it up. There's plenty of research around these and how they do lower prolactin. They would be more likely to be my go-to things that would be less habit-forming. Now, lyserate is also fairly dopamine agonist-y, but I still, my opinion, it's it's less side effects and less risk for addiction than the kind of more common stuff than bromocryptine or cabagoline that is more commonly you know, used, but of course, you know, see a doctor, uh, to check on that in your case. Perfect. And, uh, we've got our last two on the list. And, um, so we've got bioavailable testosterone and SHBG sex hormone binding globulin. And before we go into those two, could you just please quickly explain the difference between the bioavailable testosterone and the testosterone free testosterone that we were talking about earlier? It's the same, bioavailable testosterone. Uh, so basically most of your testosterone in your blood is bound up in a kind of storage form. Now, again, there's a bit of, what's the word, lack of consensus about this. Um, the kind of more classic view that you see is the only testosterone that's worth talking about is free testosterone. If it's bound up, it's useless. Um, people these days are saying, eh, it's not quite as simple as that because your body actually uses these things to transport them where they need to go. Um, but it is certainly true, and I can so I can see why that classic view has come about, that from an experiential view, generally how you feel will correlate a lot more with your level of free testosterone or bioavailable testosterone than it will correlate with your overall testosterone. So it does seem to be the case that, you know, that matters a lot. Um, and the primary thing that it's bound to that is measured is SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin. It's also al albumin and other stuff, but SHBG is usually the one that's focused on. So what they usually do in these blood, blood lab tests, they will measure your testosterone, they will measure your SHBG, um, and then they will do a calculation of what your free bioavailable testosterone is, rather than actually measuring it. 
I think I've seen tests before where they actually measure it, but the vast majority of the time it's a calculation. So based on you know, your SHBG and your testosterone, here's what we believe your free testosterone is likely to be. And so usually that's what we're talking about. And so I remember when I was testing this a few years ago, my testosterone was really high, but then my SHBG was also really high. I think it was above the reference range. And so it meant my free testosterone was only like mid-ish range. And so I started doing a, like going on a hunt of like, how do you lower SHBG? And a lot of men, I think that's, if, if they think about SHBG at all, it's they're thinking about how to lower it. And I was quite surprised that from what I could see, there was a lot of talk about don't lower it, you know, whether it's in articles or YouTube videos or whatever. And so it turns out that just like cholesterol, um, it's not actually a bad thing. And you want to be very careful before you lower it or considering lowering it. Now, having said that, I think if it's over the reference range, as it was for me, it is a sign of an issue. Um, and what kind from, of issue do you think it is? Yeah, from what I can make out, it's other hormones and specifically it's related to thyroid, but actually more commonly uh, blood sugar, uh, blood sugar issues. And so um, I think when you're on a very low carbohydrate diet, for instance, that often is something that will spike uh, SHBG. So I'm not necessarily saying diabetes or whatever. I'm saying like when your body's having a trouble regulate blood sugar, that's when SHBG uh, will go high. Um, so I'm pretty sure about that. So that, that, that it's that way around. That's the correlation. Whereas if you have a more high carbohydrate diet, then the SHBG uh, will actually go down. Um, and so that's something to to be aware of. And again, if you're like, well, I love my low carbohydrate diet, Owen, and if there's no problem with having high HBG because you still feel all the benefits of testosterone, then fine, right? If there's no issue, then there's no issue. As I said, there's nothing medically bad about having SHBG at least at the top of the reference range as far as I'm aware um, but uh, you know that that could be a reason um, now in terms of natural stuff uh, something that definitely does seem to be effective at uh, raising the level of free testosterone or bioavailable testosterone is toncadely. Uh that's a herb that's probably the primary mechanism that it's effective and my personal experience with toncadely is like that it's probably the most effective of the kind of sex drive boosting herbs. In fact, too much. I really can't take it. It's <laughs> it's, it's it's excessive. Uh, f by my experience, though, you know, I know for some people it does nothing. It all depends, and maybe it's because I have that tendency for high SHBG that it made more of a difference to me, and, and still does. I don't know. Even though my SHBG is kind of mid range these days, but um, but yeah. So Tonka Ali would definitely be you know probably my primary go to if you did want to lower it um and actually medically i'm not aware of any kind of drug options to do it um i think it is you know going to be uh, either herbal or like addressing the root cause and as i said because the kind of consensus generally seems to be with doctors and stuff that you don't want to lower your shpg specifically by any at least artificial means um there isn't really like even in the kind of alternative you know, abusing things you shouldn't world. I haven't really seen a bunch of stuff that <laughs> lowers SHBG. Um, now, having said that, one of the ways you can tell if someone is taking testosterone or steroids and all the rest of it is often the SHBG is really low in, um, so if you're injecting testosterone, even bioidentical testosterone ever, uh, you, you tend to have very high levels of free testosterone then you know, if it is natural. So I suppose if your SHBG is really high, um, that's the other way around it that's actually most commonly used because TRT <clears throat> is extremely common these days. You know, it's extremely common among middle to upper income people, you know, men like 40 plus. Um, and it's extremely common as well among, you know, actors, um, you know, sports people, models, anyone where performance and or looks you know, is important for the role that you do. Um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of men on it these days and often they're not even on, you know, the good form that we're talking about, like reasonable levels that are just, you know, would replace what your testicles would make anyway. They're on like way, way, way high levels because they're trying to boost that anabolic effect and put on muscle. That's probably like the number one reason. Um, and so, yeah, it is very common. 
And so I think maybe that's the other reason why there's not a huge amount of SHBG lowering stuff because it's just not relevant when you're on some kind of TRT and everyone who's into this stuff seems to be on some kind of TRT. So that could be it as well. Right, okay. Well, this has been really informative. Um, now that we've gone over everything, what is how often should people test to try and find their levels? Is there a better test to do for their male hormone optimization? Talk to us a little bit about that before we close. Yeah, good question. So, <clears throat> the, you know, I often recommend like an ultimate test, like there's equivalents of it, I think. There's one in the UK, there's equivalents in US and Australia, I know, because I've seen people's results. And generally that includes estradiol, testosterone, FSH, LH, prolactin, SHBG, and free testosterone, out of the ones we've talked about so far. It usually doesn't include DHT, that's an add-on. It usually doesn't include progesterone, but sometimes it does. Progesterone as an add-on is not that expensive. DHT as an add-on usually is expensive and it takes a long time. And then pregnenolone also is an add-on that's very expensive and hard to get. Um, what, and so, ab what about DHEA? Oh, and DHEA, sorry, that's, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's one of the common ones. That it, It's an adrenal hormone, so it's not in the sex hormone category like every other one I listed there. Um, but it's, it's pretty common in one of those kind of ultimate hormone uh, tests so yeah so uh, along with cortisol usually usually have dhea and cortisol so blood test is my opinion i know different people have different opinions some people like to do saliva some people like to do urine like a dutch test um, i've done both of those oh, you know maybe i'll ask someone on to debate with me about this like none of it's perfect with hormones so like they build up in different areas and the blood doesn't reflect that that's true but my problem with, you know, urine is it's only what your body's excreting, which is not a foolproof system. My problem with, you know, saliva is that it can be greatly affected by things like adrenaline, how much is coming through because adrenaline will, you know, uh, vasoconstrict and reduce the flow of all kinds of, you know, stuff, including hormones to, um, to the saliva. So, and again, it's, it's kind of an excretion. It's not, a, a perfect reflection so there is no such thing as a perfect reflection even a biopsy would not be perfect because you'd only have one area of your body not the whole body the only perfect way would be to get you put you in a mincer <laughs> you know like there's no way to be there's no way to live and see a perfect reflection of your hormones basically so you're, you're always doing your best but out of the ways of doing it i would say uh you know blood is the way that i would do it and all those tests together Without the DHT or pregnant loan, usually you can get for like hundred pounds ish, hundred dollars, hundred and fifty dollars ish. It's it's you know perfectly reasonable. How frequently depends on your symptoms. If you are feeling great, uh, once a year maybe as a man, just to make sure that nothing is creeping in the wrong direction in any significant degree. Uh, but if you're struggling and you're taking stuff to try and improve it, ideally every six weeks to three months you know like there's really no reason not to do it frequently and there's an argument you know even let's say you're getting my products from one of my you know male support brands or whatever um it would be better to do it before and after right test take that supplement or anyone else's supplement see if it's working and you know same for um same for any of the medical stuff we talked about as well, see if it's working. It isn't necessarily. Now, how you feel is a better guide. Like, I know Tom Cowley has that effect on me. Um, you know, I don't need a blood test to tell me that. And so it, it could be the same. I know, uh, you know, a lot of people who are customers of that, that, those companies I talked about, they absolutely love it. You know, it, they're sure that it works for them. And that's great, you know. But um, if you're trying to fine tune, if you're trying to optimize and not just re you know, like feel better or resolve a symptom, then I'd say that's where testing is definitely necessary. And otherwise, it's just, you know, a good idea. But ultimately, you know, it depends what we're talking about. Look, if we're talking about cardiovascular health, then feeling good is not enough. You actually need to test because the reason it's called the silent killer is because you'd be fine, 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 dead. That's not really the case with hormones. Um, you're not like, I'm so happy, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. Oh my God, my hormones are all low. Oh, like, like <laughs> you'll feel it 
if your hormones are not optimal. And so how you feel is a good guide and how you, you know, perform sexually and your body and energy and depression and all that kind of stuff is a good guide. And so it isn't absolutely necessary. But what I would say is if you've been trying a long time and trying different supplements and different exercise regimes and, you know, this and that, and it doesn't seem to be working, it's much better to have actual like facts in front of you as much as they may not be perfect with any test like to to see what is going on um you may think it's low testosterone and it may not be you know usually those ultimate tests will also include you know thyroid and a bunch of other markers um you know like it's good to get a, a holistic take of what actually is going on maybe your testosterone is high and it's actually free testosterone you know, uh, maybe your testosterone is high and it's actually that the prolactin is also high and that's the thing that's still giving you low energy and low mood and all the rest. Like, so it's really good to just test and actually see f rather than guessing. Yeah, get the data. Absolutely. Well, beautiful, Ellen. This has been highly informative and very, very helpful, I'm certain, to some of our listeners. And so I just wanted to ask you, are there any other final thoughts before we say goodbye? Uh, yeah. Remember, I am not a doctor. Uh, I'm not just saying this to cover myself every person is different and unique and you know i've done a few more and i'm sure I'll do more i noticed when i was talking about this stuff earlier on people are like oh i can't find a doctor who will actually apply all this stuff you talked about oh and so i'm trying to get you know more and more of those on as guests who are doing exactly the kind of stuff we've talked about in this episode um to show you yes there are uh, there are plenty of doctors out there is it the majority no are you going to get them on maybe your free health service if you're in a, a country where it's free Unfortunately, probably not, unless you're lucky. But do they exist? Yes. Do they know at least as much of what I'm talking about and more? Yes. Are they willing and able to help you? Yes. And so I really encourage you to find the right doctor for you who understands all this stuff and more who can really help you optimize. It's it's worth doing. Fantastic. Oh, and, 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 and sorry, and, and one more thing. Remember, there is a genetic component to this. And so that's where genetic insights is helpful. Like for me... Um, looking at all the blood test stuff was useful and helpful-ish, but when I saw my genetics and I saw I had a genetic tendency to high cortisol and I had a genetic tendency to low DHT, all the pieces started to fit into place and I was actually able to start to work stuff out and resolve stuff. So um, blood tests are good, but um, seeing the kind of genetic root of things is also, um, you know, invaluable and valuably helpful because as i said the problem with blood test results is not only are they not perfect but also they change you know like for instance if you and i've seen this for myself if you do a blood test literally like first thing in the morning like within half an hour an hour after waking up versus if you do it three or four hours after waking up which is what most people do even when they're doing a morning fasting test still a lot of people get up at 6 a.m they don't get to the surgery or get the blood draw until 9 10 something like that that's going to very much change your hormonal profile versus if you're doing it as soon as you wake up. Like, so that's just one example. So as much as I love blood tests and do recommend them, they are transitory. Um, and so getting that genetic to see what your genetic baselines are as well is super helpful. And that's when I work with people, we always do both. Usually I'll work with medical doctors as well if we're talking about anything hormonal. But, you know, usually we'll look at the blueprint genetically first. Then I will either refer them to a doctor or work with a doctor to really optimize things together. Um, and if you're interested in working with me in that regard, um, if you would like to, you know, really, as I said, not just treat it, but get to the root issues and, and work on that level, then uh, reach out to me at the uh, um, elwin at feelyounger.net. And, uh, you know, we can talk about if uh, maybe I can help you that way. But the first step really, before you even reach out to me, is to get the genetic insights, uh, geneticinsights.co. Um, get your genetics tested because, you know, I'm not a licensed doctor, but I am able to go through your genetics with you. And then I'm able to, as I said, either refer onto a doctor or work with our in-house doctor to, you know, apply that along with blood test results to really optimize. Well said. And again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I can see you guys are leaving your comments and your questions most re recently as well, which has been wonderful. We enjoy going through them and keep the conversation going here. Remember, let us know what you're thinking, what you liked, what questions you have. If And also as well, if you have any topics that you want us to discuss, 
put those in the comments. Let us do that. Let us bring that to you. We love doing this. We love bringing this information to you and your interaction with us is invaluable. So keep doing it. Keep hitting the like and the subscribe button. Share this with people that you think might be interested and we will see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below, if you want to click on that one and watch that next.